Welcome back to our series on Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth, which is sponsored by the Christadelphian Video Service. And as we go through these presentations, we always say, look, if you feel the need to stop um, and work on the, the matters that have been raised and, and check them out for yourself, please do that. Just pause and then come back when, when you want to resume and go on with the rest of it. We always invite you to, to spend a bit of time because uh, of necessity, we have to get through these sessions reasonably quickly but you may need more time to explore in between some of the items we raise. So we're going to talk about rightly dividing the word and particularly types and shadows in this session. But before we do that, we'll just pick up on our homework from the last session. And we ask you to check out Moffat. And if you did that, you will see that Moffat is very good at portraying the poetical structure of the record and makes it very clear for us to see that a lot of these things were written as songs and poetry. But we also ask you to look at Melchizedek, and we'll just give you a few thoughts on Melchizedek, um, picking up from Genesis 14 and then the prophecy in Psalm 110, which is one of the most quoted passages into the New Testament. What is important is when you come to Hebrews chapter 7, it says this, that Melchizedek was made to look like the Son of God, and that is the key to understanding this type. And when you go back and you, you work out who Melchizedek was, he was king of Salem, which is being translated the king of peace, but he was first a, a king of righteousness, and Melchizedek means uh, king of righteousness. So here is a king which is a righteous king, and he's reigning in Jerusalem. So again, you get a picture. This is talking about the future king of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. But what's remarkable compared to most Bible characters we come across is that we have no genealogy. No parents are listed. He's not an member of the Aaronic priesthood. In fact, when Melchizedek was there, there was no Aaronic priesthood. That was yet to come. So here is a priest of the Most High God. A priest cannot be a priest on his own. He must have a people. So he was a, a, a priest that was over the people of God, over those who were serving God. And it's very likely that the, this priesthood that existed before the law of Moses was one that was set up in Jerusalem. And I believe possibly that Melchizedek was actually Shem. But if you could prove that, if you could prove it, you would actually destroy the type. And so you can't prove it. We do know that Shem was still alive, and we do know that in Genesis 9 that it was told of Shem that people would worship their God through him. They would come to the tents or tabernacles of Shem, um, the she to the Shekinah dwelling place of Shem, and they would worship God through Shem. So very likely Shem was Melchizedek, but you can't prove it. Deliberately you can't prove it because God wanted to make a type out of a man who has no genealogy. So it's not dependent upon genealogy. There's no limits of age for service. Under the law of Moses, you began at 30, and you know you actually had a time of service. Um, but this, there's no idea here that there was any limitation. We don't have no record of his death. He was made to look like he lived forever. A priesthood that has no recorded ending. So it never came to an end. We don't know where it went, but... Um, very likely this, of course, was brought into the law of Moses and that took over, but there's no recorded ending of it. So we have an eternal priesthood. He brought out bread and wine for fellowship with Abraham, which again is so symbolic for us. He was far greater than Abraham who paid tithes to him. He blessed Abraham. Again, he was therefore far greater. Um, and when you look at that type, it's telling you Jesus will be a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek as it says in Psalm 110. So again, the whole point of Melchizedek was to, to convince the Jews that God always foresaw the coming of his son, that his son would one day reign as a king priest, not of the order of Aaron, not of the law of Moses, but a king priest over a world at peace, a king of righteousness and a high priest forever. So Jesus is made to look like the son of God portrayed in Melchizedek. And there it's, it's quite dramatic, isn't it, to see how this type comes through. So remember, we're looking at the Bible as a very unique form of literature, very varied forms of expression. Literal and symbolic are often mixed together in different books. Reality is put alongside parable. It can reach every level of intellect. There are many things concealed by God, and we must have the determination to find those hidden gems. It's the honour of kings to search out the things that God has concealed. 
Remember all the different styles that, of, of revealing God that we find in the, the Bible, um, whether it's history or dreams or songs or prophecies or metaphors or parables or miracles or metonymy or personification. So many different methods of writing in this very, very unique book. And so we're going to look in this session at types, a very special Bible method of predicting things and of portraying things through typical events. Now, we have a great one in, in Jonah. Jonah, of course, tried to run away from God's decree that he should go and preach to Nineveh. Uh, he ran away to sea. He was caught up in a terrible storm, thrown overboard, swallowed by a great fish that God provided, and then spat up on the shore. And, you know, Jesus said this about himself. He said, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So what happened to Jonah was a type of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ and his time in the grave. And, and very, very clearly, Lord Jesus said, that happened precisely to portray my death. So isn't that quite amazing? That's, that's a type. A Bible type. In Matthew 12, verse 40, Paul says this. Sorry, in Corinthians, Paul says this. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And there are plenty of scriptures that say that. You know, right from the time that the lamb was slain in the Garden of Eden, the offering of Isaac, the, the Joseph going into the deep pit, um, Isaiah 53 Plenty of times the Bible talked about the death of Christ, Psalm 22, and so forth. It was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, what scriptures say that Jesus would rise again on the third day? And I've heard people actually say, well, you know, types are overrated, types are not needed, types are exaggerations. Well, no, if you exclude types, then you have no scriptures to talk about Christ being raised on the third day. You can only do it with types. So let's just go back to that again. You can only do it with types. So think about that. What types would you use? Well, there are a number of them you could use. But you can use, for example, Jonah. You can actually use Hezekiah's illness. Um, and there are others that you can pick up where you can actually find that Jesus was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Let's move on now to another form of writing. Some of the Bible is written in what we call acrostic writing. Now, acrostic is where a passage or a, a, a poetry or something uses letters of the alphabet in order. The Hebrew alphabet had an alphabet of 22 letters. Psalm 119 is one of seven acrostic psalms, four of which were written by David. In Psalm 119, you have 22 sections one for each letter of the alphabet. And you'll see in those sections that at the top of each those of those sections, there is a Hebrew word listed as, as the name of that section. And within that particular section, each verse in that section starts with that Hebrew letter. So this is very detailed writing of songs and poetry that actually is using the Hebrew alphabet as its, as, as its paradigm. And within those sections in Psalm 119, there are eight variations or eight different Hebrew words used to describe God's word or God's principle. So you have testimonies, statutes, uh, words, all of those words. There's eight different words used in the Hebrew to describe the principles and the words of God. So Psalm 119 is a great example of acrostic writing. When you come to Lamentations, it's also acrostic. Chapters 1, 2, 4, and 5 have 22 verses. So again, based on the Hebrew alphabet. Chapter 3 has 66 verses. So that's 7 by 22. So, um, so in, the, in that case, you get uh, 66 verses. And overall, with the other ones that have 22, there's now seven sections of 22 verses. Chapters 1, 2, and 4 use the Hebrew letters for each verse in order. So again, they follow the Hebrew alphabet. Chapter 3 has three verses with each Hebrew letter starting the verses. So that's why you end up with 66 verses. 
In chapter 5, the 22 letters are used, but are not in any alphabetical order. And it's quite interesting to think about why that might be the case. Um, bear in mind, this was Jeremiah in Australia, extreme dis di distress. So again, that's the use of acrostic things in the scriptures. Let's now talk about coded speech. Sometimes words are used in speeches and letters in code that only the ecclesia would be able to decode. And the reason this was done was that when they were in times of persecution and, and having trouble with the pagan Roman authorities, letters might be in intercepted by those authorities. Persecution might follow because they might be seen in those letters as disrespecting comments about the emperor or their empire. And so you have this, this use of coded speech, which is particularly understandable by those who believe the truth. Jesus himself uses coded speech. When he spoke about himself in the Gospels, you find that mostly he calls himself the Son of Man. That was a title that didn't cause any offence to the authorities. If he'd gone around from day one saying, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Messiah, I'm the King of Israel, then persecution would have come far too quickly and not at the appropriate time that God had determined, which was three and a half years into his ministry. So Jesus used the title of himself in public, the Son of Man. And, and only in private did he actually tell the disciples that he was the Messiah or the Son of God or the King of Israel. So again, this is use of coded speech. In 1 Peter 5 verse 13, Peter writing from Rome uses a code word uh, Babylon because believers would understand that Rome was Babylon the Great, um, that they would be taking over the, the mantle of false religion from Babylon of old, and, and therefore they would be able to interpret when Peter said uh, those in Babylon greet you that they would be, he would be talking about the city of Rome where Peter wrote the city of Babylon had been long destroyed so you know there was no no place you could write from and there were no believers in Babylon that would actually send greetings in chapter first of Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 Peter writing to the disciples talks about your adversary the devil as a roaring lion uh, by which he meant the Emperor Nero. Nero was a false accuser of the saints. He persecuted them mercilessly. He fed them to the lions in the Colosseum. He took many, many lives. But Peter couldn't say in, in writing this letter that Nero is persecuting you. He, he wants to kill you because that again would be insulting to the emperor if it fell into the wrong hands. So we have in the Bible coded speech, which is directing to the ecclesia to understand these things that they can actually interpret the code that was used at that particular time. In Revelation 2 verse 13, you know, we have this reference to Pergamos from Jesus Christ, where Satan's seat is, and it was a Roman colony. Again, that's coded speech. This is a place where Satan or the pagan Roman Empire has a very firm seat, a, a place which was a Roman colony where they would have administrative centres and military garrisons. So again, the, the use here is coded speech for the ecclesia to interpret. So that's another form of Bible um, methodology we need to understand. So some homework now on types. Um, Jesus was buried and rose on the third day according to the scriptures. I want you to go make a list of those scriptures that actually by types would tell you that Jesus would rise on the third day, or even that he would rise from the dead, and especially on the third day, because we're told it was according to the scriptures. Also, I'd like you to think about how Jeremiah was a type of Christ. We all know that Joseph was the greatest type of the Lord Jesus Christ, and there are many other people like Isaac who typed the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jeremiah, perhaps I think, is one of the greatest types of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'd like you to make a list of things that actually relate Jeremiah to the Lord Jesus Christ and, and some of the things that Jeremiah suffered, which could very much have a parallel to the work of Christ. So that's the homework to do some work on types. So according to the scriptures in Corinthians, what were those scriptures that actually indicated that Jesus would rise on the third day? Thank you.